Hi everyone, my name is Adrian. Uh, I'm a co-founder of Sigma Prime. I thought I'd just give a brief introduction about Sigma Prime, who we are, what we do, uh, and before I introduce Dimitri to talk about uh, contract creation in the EVM. So Sigma Prime, we originally started as a small company inside Australia, but we have since grown uh, to be somewhat global all the way around the world. Um, we're a group of security researchers, academics, uh, software engineers working towards a secure and decentralized future. Uh, what I mean by that is we actively try and contribute, well, we, we actively contribute to the core protocol of the uh, Ethereum blockchain. We're trying to advance the technology to make it uh, a little bit more widespread, more publicly used, and at the same time we're trying to uh, increase the general security posture of the ecosystem through security reviews and any way we can help on the security side. Uh, so we're scattered mostly around the world. We cover most of the time zones, uh, which is handy if things go wrong because you've always got somebody awake at any given time. Uh, but luckily for us uh, in our ecosystem, nothing ever breaks and no one ever has to be awake, right? That's a joke because our ecosystem is regularly hacked. Uh, so what do we do? We, the way that I usually think about this is that we have two major efforts or two major focuses inside Sigma Prime. One is a, an R&D effort, uh, which has culminated in a project which is called Lighthouse. Lighthouse is an Ethereum consensus client, so that is a piece of software that uh, essentially does staking and uh, is how the Ethereum blockchain comes to consensus and decides on what is the canonical block of a given chain. So it was officially started in 2018. Uh, it's written in Rust. Uh, it's, all, it's free and always, oh, it's, all, it's always, it's always going to be. It's free and open source and always going to be. You can modify and change the code to use it however you like. Uh, we have a strong emphasis on security uh, because we have a security background. We actively, uh, the, there's a, a bug bounty currently uh, in the Ethereum Foundation. So if you f happen to have some spare time and you want to have a look at doing some security testing, our client is, has a bug bounty. So we're actively uh, trying to defend against uh, various attacks. Uh, we also optimize for performance so that you can still run nodes at home on your network without um, having to, you know, go and buy a data center or something anywhere else. Uh, the other main focus, which is probably more relevant to the talk that we're giving now, is that we're security focused. So we don't just focus on uh, individual application level security. We do EVM and non-EVM contracts. Uh, we look at layer two systems. Uh, fuzzing is another uh, major effort that we do. Uh, one project that's uh, publicly available is a project called Beacon Fuzz. It's a system where we, uh, we're essentially fuzzing consensus clients. So there's five different consensus clients in the Ethereum network. We build a differential fuzzer that checks the, uh, essentially a lot of the common functions that happen across each of these clients and make sure that they're all to specification. If there's differences between there, you can get chain splits and, and some very nasty things. And that's been very, um, very successful in terms of finding some very critical vulnerabilities in, in the consensus clients. So we look at core blockchain protocols, people that build blockchains from the ground up. Uh, as we've built one from scratch ourselves, we're familiar with a lot of the core primitives that go into blockchain. So things such as the cryptographic primitives, the consensus mechanisms, uh, unique network protocols that people like to build. So we have experience and we're kind of like doing a lot of security reviews and trying to help um, build even blockchains from scratch uh, to improve their security posture. We also look at cloud infrastructure. Um, we uh, ZK circuits as well as something we, we've started looking at and red teaming social engineering. And for, yeah, so for the next slide, um, in general, we look at information security. Uh, so just as a high level overview, uh, we are an information security uh, consultancy. We specialize solely in the blockchain space, so we don't do anything other than blockchain things. Uh, we work on most layers, as I was saying, in a variety of chains, including um, yeah, new chains that have been built from, built from scratch uh, with their own unique custom mechanisms. Uh, so just a, a brief list of some of the projects that we've worked on, just to give you an idea. We work on new coins, uh, such as Filecoin, like new blockchain systems near Layer 2s, uh, liquid staking, liquid staking tokens uh, and um, pretty much, yeah, I don't know, if it, if it exists on a blockchain, we, 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 we're we happy to have a look at it and try and try and help. Uh, so if, yeah, if you want to know anything more about us, uh, have a look at our website, sigmaprime.io. 
If you're more interested in Lighthouse, it has its own website. That's uh, lighthouse.sigmaprime.io. Uh, you can follow us on Twitter or X. That's sigp underscore io. We have a booth out the back. Uh, there's yeah, there's a few of us over there. We're friendly. We've got some swag if you want to come and have a chat. Uh, we're doing a, if you're interested in Rust, so we, we do a lot of Rust because, uh, because of the Lighthouse client, uh, we're going to be doing a workshop on how to fuzz Rust. So if you don't know what fuzzing is and you don't know what Rust is, we can come and teach you both of those things. That's at 4 p.m. downstairs. Uh, but in general, just free, feel free to come, come and have a chat with us. Uh, we're happy to, happy to have a talk. So I won't uh, waste any more time and I'll pass it on to Dimitri who's going to be talking about... Uh, uh, yeah, I'm passing. Yep, thanks. Uh, so yeah, a little bit about myself. I'm a blockchain security engineer at Sigma Prime. Uh, I mainly audit uh, smart contracts on the EVM, but I've done some climate, uh, client implementations as well. Uh, today we're going to cover two topics. Uh, basically, how contract creation occurs in the EVM and is create to deterministic. So here are some random headlines. Um, oh, <laughs> uh, here are some random headlines from various sources online showing that uh, most auditors and developers believe that Create2 produces deterministic addresses. Uh, so I've left this point here. Uh, I know it's not a philosophy class, but just to briefly dive into origin stories, determinism is the doctrine that all state-changing events are devoid of free will. Obviously, this is different to computational or algorithmic determinism. Uh, in general, those mean same inputs equals same outputs. Uh, but when we define something so concrete, uh, we create assumptions about how our world state will look. Are those assumptions accurate? So, um, yeah, basically, in the... Uh, uh, so, yeah, in the EVM, uh, determinism really refers to the same input of transactions equals the same output of world states. Therefore, one truly could say that all contract creation events are deterministic. So why would it be something exclusive to create two? Hopefully by the end of this uh, presentation, you'll see how certain inputs are more controlled in create two than other contract creation methods. Uh, leading to a more predictable address creation, uh, but not infallible, and we are no more deterministic than we started. So how do contract creations actually happen? They happen one of three ways. Uh, one, an EOA account uh, owner can send a JSON RPC message uh, to signal creation to uh, contract creation to the EBM. Uh, two, a contract can actually create another contract using the create opcode or that contract could use the create to opcode. I think my slides are a bit mismatched. Um, so yeah, let's start with the first method, EOA transactions. Uh, the definition of contract creation function looks like this. Uh, so these might be random letters to you. Here's a kind of breakdown of what all of those things mean. Uh, so without kind of wasting too much time, the most important thing here uh, is that you provide the contract creation function uh, with the initialization EVM code. Uh, something that's also not captured here is that for EOAs, uh, in order to trigger this function, you need to uh, send a transaction to the null address recipient, which is a little different from the zero address. So here is a log, um, uh, basically from a simple script that sends a raw transaction to an Infura endpoint via JSON RPC. Uh, zooming in a little bit, uh, here I've color-coded the params, uh, which in hindsight might be a little bit hard to see. Not sure if this pointer, okay, pointer doesn't work. But um, here you can see the blue indicates uh, the transaction is going to the null address recipient, uh, just indicated there in uh, 80 in hex. Uh, and basically an address for the new contract will be calculated, and we'll go into that process in a little bit. Uh, it's based on the sender address and the nonce, uh, which you can see highlighted in brown um, at the beginning just after the 78. So why do we actually need opcodes? Uh, so the main difference between smart contracts 
uh, is that they don't actually execute transactions through JSON RPC. Instead, they use message calls and specific opcodes uh, that signify to the EVM to create a contract. Uh, and that uses the function from earlier. So uh, the create opcode is one of those message calls, uh, triggers contract creation at a specific address point uh, based on the calculation defined in the yellow paper. Uh, so basically the address calculation involves the catch act hash of the sender and the nonce. Uh, and the nonce of an EOA account is the number of transactions sent by that account, starting at the value one and uh, incrementing with every transaction. Uh, the nonce of a smart contract starts at zero and increments with every new contract creation. So based on that, we have a way to calculate addresses based on the predicted nonce. Uh, but what happens when the nonce changes before we use the create opcode? So, uh, that basically leads us to have the incorrect predicted address. Um, so that's where we created create2. Uh, it functions almost identically to create, except for address calculation. It's based on the KKAC hash of uh, 0xFF, the sender address, the salt, and the uh, hash of the init code. So create2 allows us to opt out of using the nonce for a contract and instead specify our own salt uh, and provide the init code of the contract into the address calculation. So it seems now we have uh, basically a more predictable contract creation uh, capability. Uh, so nothing could change that, right? Well, um, what is kek i in the address calculation formula? So based on the yellow paper, it's actually an unlimited size byte array specifying EVM code for initialization. And that possibly couldn't change, right? Is the init code all that it seems? No, probably not. So the init code contains the contract bytecode. And a little digging into the solidity docs on what that contains, you might find the following. Uh, so the bytecode actually contains the metadata hash, which includes a bunch of stuff that you might, uh, a bunch of stuff that might change, even if your code doesn't. As we can see here, the metadata hash is a hash of the following looking JSON structure. Uh, the file folder structure is also included. Any changes to the folder structure, the file name, the solidity version, virtually anything will change the hash of this file. But changing the hash of this file also changes the init code. And changing the init code changes the address calculation. Uh, so basically, you could do a version upgrade with no changes to the code um, or any dependencies simply containing a file name change. Uh, and you'll end up with a different create2 address. So this takes me back to our original question. What is the concept of more determinism in uh, if we're already working in a deterministic system. The problem we aim to solve initially regarded a reasonable way to calculate addresses. And basically, I believe this got confused with 100% infallible and deterministic address calculation. Uh, so let's take a look at a real world example. Uh, basically, this contains some modified code from, uh, with the same logic as one of our client's code bases. In this code, you can create a vault using Open Zeppelin Create2 library. The salt used is the kekak hash of the message sender details. But remember that Create2 under the hood uses the init code of the contract. So from there, you can withdraw from your vault using uh, the address calculation that retrieves the message sender vault, effectively providing some access control for withdrawals. Uh, maybe it's a little bit minimalistic, but no devastating bugs occur here. The functionality in its current context is clean until it isn't. So the, this code was actually initially built uh, to be upgradable. Uh, so the code changes during upgrades, so that obviously would change the init code and the create2 hash. 
Uh, so let's assume that for whatever reason the code didn't even change, it's a dependency changing, it's folder structure under normal uh, Solidity compiler options, the metadata inserted into the contract bytecode will differ. As a result, the init code will differ. Um, and like we discussed, so will the address. So this will effectively DOS people from being able to withdraw out of their own vault. Um, and even less likely, but still possible, people could miraculously uh, accidentally withdraw out of someone else's vault. So uh, something I feel like I've shown here is that basically through a questioning process, you could arrive at a particularly interesting issue. Uh, don't be scared of the yellow paper and low-level technical details. Once you identify a critical code branch, uh, you should follow the breadcrumbs basically as far as they go, time permitting. Um, finally, if you're building contract upgradability, uh, you really need to take extra care, make sure parts of your system that you expect to be deterministic aren't broken unexpectedly during version upgrades. So this actually proves to be considerably difficult. Um, so where could an auditor go from here and you know, dig deeper? Uh, so basically, in this example, I just considered normal Solidity compiler options. And uh, as you know, there's other options. Uh, so one particular interesting option uh, is the intermediate representation, uh, which basically allows for Yule and significant gas optimizations. Uh, basically, uh, up there on the slides there, um, and in the Solidity docs, if you look through them, there's uh, some breaking changes for intermediate representation, where basically uh, uh, order of state variable initialization differs, uh, so you end up with different um, uh, initial state after um, contract deployment uh, between two latest Solidity versions and like a version below. Uh, and uh, then also modifiers are handled differently. Uh, so if you use repeated modifiers in your uh, contract functions, um, you may end up with a different state than you expected. Uh, so yeah, um, uh, these kind of things build in extra quirks into contract upgradability, uh, making it more challenging. So if you use something that's not custom, or if you're not predicting that something may change in a Solidity version, uh, you might end up being in trouble when you upgrade. Um, and that's something you actually have to consider as you build upgradability. Uh, so the point here is not that uh, intermediate representation documentation will lead you to some massive bug bounty payout. Uh, but training yourself to not get bored and dive deeper into issues uh, will train your mind to hump for chaotic code even when it is clean and safe, because it might not stay that way, uh, which I think is something exciting about auditing upgradable contracts uh, as it introduces new ways of thinking uh, about uh, basically creative problem creation. Uh, so yeah, um, if you'd like, uh, you can uh, feel free to follow me on Twitter or X or whatever version changes that name goes through next. Uh, I'll slowly be sharing some more quirky behavior in and outside of my time at Sigma Prime. Um, and yeah, you can reach me here. Uh, but yeah, uh, while that's still on there, I um, thought I'd mention, because I have a little bit of extra time, uh, so somewhere you could dive a little bit deeper into a place that potentially solves some of the deterministic problems about Create2 uh, is Create3. So uh, it's uh, basically uh, EIP-3171. Uh, uh, they have a proposal for introducing a new opcode. And um, yeah, it's an interesting solution to this problem. It removes the init code from uh, the address calculation. Uh, there's also an interesting uh, Uniswap pair uh, uh, bit of code that uses create three in, EV in EVM code. Basically what they do is uh, they deploy using create two, a minimal proxy, uh, which then uses create to deploy another proxy contract. Uh, sorry, to deploy the actual contract that you were initially aiming for. So uh, they can use create2 to create a deterministic address, uh, and then to get around the init code, uh, they deploy using create, uh, which only uses the nonce of the newly deployed contract, which is zero. Um, so yeah, uh, that's it for my talk today. <laughs>